I'm Andy Tannenbaum, and I thought I knew how to make this thing talk to the other thing. Normally it works. I've never seen it quite this bad before, but I'm sorry, but I guess there's not much I can do about it. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about a re-implementation of NetBSD using a microkernel, and this is the work done by my students and my programmers, and I just sort of watched. Okay, our goal... Our goal has changed over the years, but our goal is sort of now to build a reliable operating system, okay? So what's a reliable operating system? Okay, L let me give you my definition. Uh, an operating system is said to be reliable when a typical user has never experienced even a single failure in his or her lifetime and does not know anybody who's ever experienced a failure. In engineering terms, we're probably talking about mean time to failure, 50 years, something like that. Um, I don't think we're there yet. Some people say things are reliable. Uh -uh. You know, there's people say, well, you know, if God wanted computers to work, he wouldn't have invented reset buttons. I, I don't think that's really where we're at. You may think that, but ask your grandmother. You know? I mean, her attitude is, well, why doesn't it work? Because okay? most other things work. Okay, so let me say a couple of words about what I call the television model. Step one, you buy the television. Step two, you plug it in. Step three, it works perfectly for the next 10 years. Like that's where, although as televisions are becoming computers, this is becoming less so. But so <laughs> traditionally, this is the way televisions work. You know, the, okay. Now the computer model, Windows edition. Um, <laughs> you buy the computer, you plug it in. Okay, so we're two thirds of the way there. It's just this little thing about, now, and now it works perfectly for the next 10 years. Well, it's not quite that. First you have to install service packs one through nine F. Okay, and then you have to, um, install 18 new emergency security patches that came after 9F, okay? And then you've got to find and install seven new device drivers, because all the ones they gave you are obsolete. And then you install the antivirus software, and then you install the anti-spyware software, and then you install the anti-hacker software, and then um, you install the anti-spam software, and then you reboot the computer, okay? Um, actually, I'm not done. I just ran out of space on the slide. There's more, okay? It doesn't work. So you call the help desk, okay? And you wait on hold for 30 minutes, and then they tell you to reinstall Windows, which is what you're trying to do in the first place, right? And um, typical user reaction is something like this, okay? Except for us, where it's fun to play with it, but you know, for grandma, it's not fun. Um, New York Times had a thing a while back saying that 25% of computer users have actually hit the computer because they were so angry with it, you know? It's not the monitor's fault. If you hit something, hit the computer itself. Don't hit the monitor. The monitor wasn't, it's not its fault. Okay. So I, I don't think uh, we're, we're quite there in terms of um, you know, reliability and so on. Is reliability important? Well, it's annoying when it doesn't work, you know, and there's some lost work. But you should also think about other situations. For example, industrial control systems in factories. You know, cars are moving down the assembly line and something crashes and they've got to stop everything. They don't like that very much. Um, or power grids, you know, power grid goes down for a reboot for a couple of minutes. You get a lot of antsy people about that. Um, hospital operating rooms, most doctors like to work in the light, okay. Um, you know, banking and e-commerce servers, they're down for five minutes. You know, they measure the amount of money they're losing, you know, sort of megabucks, megabucks per minute there. Um, emergency phone centers, there's a lot of applications, control software in cars and airplanes and all kinds of things. There's lots of applications where people actually care a lot about you know, reliability. Is it feasible to make it reliable? First of all, we'll never know if we don't try. Um, the Dutch Royal Academy of Sciences gave me two million euros to, to try, so I said thank you very much, and we tried. Then the European Union gave me two and a half million euros to give it a shot, so I was very grateful for that, so we're giving it a shot. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, is it achievable at all? Maybe you can't make nothing, nothing you can't make this stuff reliable, okay? I, I, don't, I don't buy that. Um, systems can survive hardware failures. For example, um, RAIDs can survive a failed disk. You have a RAID system, a disk fails, it just stops working, makes a big screeching noise, magnetic oxide is flying all over the place, and the whole RAID continues to work, because RAIDs are designed to work even if a drive fails. In fact, you can design a RAID which can survive two failed drives if you want. It just requires more redundancy. Um, memory can fail. ECC memories can recover from memory failures, okay? 
Um, TCP can survive from packets that get lost. Packet gets lost somewhere, it understands how to deal with that. Well, I didn't get an acknowledgement, I'll send it again. You know, um, so uh, ECD-ROMs and, and DVD drives, three quarters of the bits on these optical media are error correcting bits. So, you know, a 700 megabyte CD-ROM isn't actually 700 megabytes, it's about three gigabytes. And there's a 14-bit number is used to encode an 8-bit number, and then there's a 3,000-byte number and used to encode a 2,048-byte sector, and so on. There's many levels of redundancy to make it work. So, you know, if you can survive hardware failures, for heaven's sakes, we ought to be able to survive software failures. That's a lot easier than surviving hardware failures. Okay? Um, so I think we need to rethink operating systems. Um, and the research on this, I think, needs to be refocused somewhat that performance isn't the only thing, only game in town, although some people seem to think it is. We have nearly infinite hardware on just regular generic PCs these days. That, um, I, I, looked, I looked this up once. I started on the IBM 709, which cost $30 million and filled up a room this size. An iPad is about 30,000 times faster than the fastest computer in the world 40 years ago and has about 10,000 times more RAM of the biggest computer in the world that cost $30 million. Okay, there's a lot of power in modern PCs. So lots of RAM, lots of cycles, lots of bandwidth. There's tons of useless bloatware on all modern software. And so the software is slow and bloated and buggy. It doesn't have to be like that. That's self-inflicted. So to achieve what I would call the, um, the TV model, I think future operating systems need to be smaller, simpler, modular, very important, reliable, and secure and in particular self-healing, which is, I think, really the key. It's got to fix itself, okay? Hardware can fix itself. RAIDs can fix their problems. TCP can fix its problems. ECC memories can fix their problems. Why can't the software fix its own problems? It's got to be easier than the hardware. So that's what we're sort of working on. Here's a very brief history of the work we've been doing. As um, I think that Steve mentioned that morning, in 1976, John Lyons wrote kind of a, a commentary on Unix version 6 describing it line by line, what it did, okay? And in 1979, AT&T panicked and said, you can't have students understanding our, our Unix system. This is terrible. So the new license forbid writing any books about it or, or teaching it in classes and so on. And then, you know, a few years later, I said, you know, maybe I could write a Unix-like system myself that was sort of like version 7 and didn't have this crazy licensing thing on it. And so I wrote a book, and it came out in 1987, and the, there was, there was uh, I think, a CD-ROM in the back of the book with the, all the code. In, oh, no, there, there was, before that, there were floppy disks you could get in a separate box because CD-ROM drives weren't that common yet. So there were like eight floppy disks, which had the whole source code and everything on it. Um, then in 97, we made it POSIX compatible because POSIX had now come out. And then 2000, we changed the license, the BSD license. That previously, they were selling the box of things at $69, which was the actual manufacturing cost for the eight floppy disks and the book about it you know, in the box and everything. So I convinced them, they didn't understand what they were doing. Um, convinced them, let's go with the BSD license, we went with that. And um, then, uh, by this time it had been out there on the internet a little bit, but the internet wasn't so big in 1987. Um, as some of you may know, Linus Torvalds wrote in his biography that he had bought a PC for the purpose of running Minix, and he began reading it and began changing it and, and so on. So in a sense, Linux is a fork of, uh, of Minix, which is kind of, but of course, BSD guys know about forks, so you know. <laughs> Um, the third edition of the book came out. I, I got the European grant, and then we moved toward embedded systems and toward NetBSD, which I'll tell you about later. Okay, so there's been three editions of the book. Um, okay, intelligent design, at least as applied to operating systems. Um, I I'm, have been and always, I think, you know, been attacked for, but I still believe in microkernels. The key piece of software on a computer, the kernel, should be small enough that you understand it. You know, William, you know M Linux is now... 15 million lines, Windows is well over 100 million lines. Nobody understands it. Imagine you're starting at, at Windows, at Microsoft, and they say, we'd like you to work on, uh, on the Windows kernel. Here's a, book, you know, a room listing 100 million lines, which takes up 18 bookcases of the code. I mean, nobody there understands that. You know, I mean, you've got a product that nobody really understands. It's not a formula for you know, a bug-free kind of thing. People have studied bugs in great detail. You know, in companies, they often have like registers, and if you make a, you know, if you find a bug, you have to tell them, and they register it and they log it. People have studied these logs, and getting down to like, you know, one to ten bugs per thousand lines of code is about the best you can do. You know, one bug per per thousand lines of code, it seems to be the best anybody can do. There's been very few recorded instances of actually doing better than that. Um, the Minix has got 15,000 lines of code, so there's 15 bugs in the kernel 
we're looking for them, we can't find them yet, but there's a chance we might. You know, Linux probably has 15,000 bugs. Not all of them are serious, of course. Some might be punctuation errors in a, in a message of some kind, but some of them are undoubtedly ser serious, and you know, other programs have this. Some of you may have noticed that Adobe updates Flash every 15 minutes because of security reasons. <laughs> like, they can't get a PDF viewer to work. You know, an operating system is harder than that, you know. Um, and drivers have, you know, studies have shown drivers have three to seven times more bugs than other stuff. I mean, everybody wants to look at the Linux, you know, paging algorithms. It's so much fun. Nobody looks at, you know, the Epson, some printer or, you know, some other printer. Nobody looks at that. And 70% of the code is, is drivers. Nobody ever looks at that. So this, that's where the bugs are. Okay. Um, I think a good system should be modular. It should run as multiple processes, which are you know, separated and have well-defined components. So one of our philosophy things is have isolated components. Okay? So move all the lo loadable modules, also the file system, memory management, everything out of the kernel, the separate processes protected by the MMU. And you know, these things then can't interfere with each other too much. Okay? So every, model, every module should run with the principle of least authority, the POLA. So if a certain module needs certain power, it should have that power. But it shouldn't have power it doesn't need. There's no reason the audio driver needs the power to fork, right? Because it just doesn't need that. And giving it that power is looking for trouble. Um, so the principle of least authority. Um, step two is to isolate the I.O. So the I.O. devices should be isolated from each other and limit access to I.O. ports. So in, in Minix, drivers don't have access to the I.O. ports. They have to go through the the microkernel to get access. So the disk driver can't actually talk to the disk. So if it wants to talk to the disk, it makes a kernel call and says, I want to write on the disk registers. And the kernel checks, oh, yeah, you're the disk driver. These are the disk ports. You're allowed to do it. Go. And it did it. Okay? But some other driver can't write on the disk port. So the audio driver can't write on the disk, even if it tries. In a monolithic system, of course, it's not supposed to, but it could technically. And you can get bugs or attacks which allow the, disk, you know, the audio driver to write on the disk. So I think it should be prevented by the hardware. And you've got to constrain DMA. Okay, so we can't write all over memory. If you have an I.O. MMU, you can get some of that in the hardware now. Okay? Isolate communication. So don't let any of these pieces talk to any other piece. Have a little table somewhere in the kernel which says, this piece is authorized to talk to that piece, and then it's okay. If you try to talk to somebody you're not supposed to talk to, then it's not okay, and it's not allowed. And also, the kernel has some calls. These aren't the POSIX calls. These are very low-level calls, like create the structure for a process that can be filled in later and so on, and handle interrupts, and it's very low-level stuff. Again, it should only be able allowed to do the ones it needs to do. So you need to make a bitmap saying, you can make these calls, and if you make any other one, you get back an error message saying, no permission. Okay? There's always a way to restrict the power of the little pieces, so they only get to do what they need to do. That's the principle of least authority. Give a component only the authority to do those things it needs to do to do its job and no more. Okay? So you restrict inter-process communication, restrict I.O., you restrict everything. Also make sure that a faulty receiver can't hang a sender. So if you know, a client sends a message to a server and then the client goes away or doesn't listen, the sender shouldn't hang trying to send an answer that the, the receiver, the original process doesn't, um, doesn't, is not listening to anymore. Anyway, here's the architecture of Minix 3. So this is kernel, which is about 15,000 lines of code. It handles interrupts, message passing, some of the scheduling, some of the inter-process communication, some of the basics for process structure and so on. And then on top of that, in user mode, are all the device drivers, each driver being a separate process. Okay? So disk driver and network driver, they're all separate. And then on top of that are the servers, like the file server and the memory server and the process server, and there's a whole bunch of those. And they're running as separate processes. And then there's the user stuff. Technically, these are all user processes, and the structure is kind of an intellectual you know, abstraction because there aren't like four levels in the hardware, although if you had four modes in the hardware, one could do this. I mean, the Intel actually does have uh, four modes, but we don't use them, so it's um, more of an intellectualization than physical structure. But the idea is each of these is a separate process protected by the MMU, so it can't do things it's not supposed to do. And so user mode device drivers, every driver runs as a, a user mode process. They don't have any super user privileges. These drivers aren't special in the sense they can violate all the rules. Um, the MMU is turned on, so they're limited to their own address space. They can't execute protected instructions and so on. Um, they don't have access to I.O. ports. They don't have access to the privileged instructions. They need to make a kernel call to do these special things, and the kernel checks if it's allowed. The servers, there's a whole bunch of them. They all run as separate processes, 
Some of the key ones are the virtual file system, the actual file servers, the process manager, memory manager, network server, uh, a thing called a reincarnation server, which brings back the dead. I'll talk more about that a little bit later. The self-healing that I mentioned earlier and reincarnation, that's a good fit, right? Okay, so here's an example of doing a read. Suppose the block you want to read happens to be in the file system's cache. So what happens? So here's the kernel, here's the structure, okay? And so the user sends a message to the file system saying, I want to do a read and specifies, you know, parameters and so on. The file system uh, checks its cache, and if it finds it in the cache, it tells the kernel, just copy this block back to the user. So the kernel says, okay, copies it back, and the file system says to the user, done. Okay? So that's an easy case where the block happens to be in the file system's cache. Now, let's consider the other case where it's not in the file system's cache. The user sends a message to the file server saying, um, you know, go read, the, I, want the, I want to read this. The file system says, oh, I don't have it in my cache. Call the, you know, call the, the kernel, tell it, write these words onto the uh, I.O. device registers for the disk to start the transfer to read you know, into my cache. And the disk, you know, makes the appropriate calls to actually do this and gets the answer, okay. And now you, it waits, it suspends, waiting for a message. And eventually an interrupt comes from the disk. The very, very low level inside the kernel, the interrupt is turned into a message to the disk. So the disk now get, it's sitting there doing a receive. It gets a message from the disk saying, hi, I'm the disk, because there's not much information in the interrupt. And then it's got to go out and read the, the disk registers by asking the kernel, please read these registers. It finds out, oh, the, the command completed correctly or didn't complete correctly. And then it goes on and, and you know, tells the file system, read completed correctly or read not completed correctly. And then the file system makes a call to the kernel, please copy this data to user space. And it does it, and then we're all done. And um, there's like, I don't know, nine messages or something like that in there. And we've timed this stuff, and it takes like half a microsecond per message, depending on, you know, for like a regular PC. It's well under a microsecond. So if we added 10 messages at half a microsecond, it adds maybe five microseconds to the total time and some loss in the context switching. But if you're doing reading from the disk, that's milliseconds. So this is kind of small potatoes, really, but there is some overhead, clearly. The, the L4 guys have managed to get all of this microkernel stuff down to about 5% overhead. We haven't really pushed that very hard, but it's possible to get the overhead down to something like 5 or 10%, I think. Anyway, now, here's this reincarnation server thing I, I talked about. Um, how does that work? Well, the reincarnation server is the parent of all the servers and drivers that's up there with before, et cetera, and it. So it owns all those servers and drivers as its children. So it, you know, when something dies, it hears about it, okay? So it gets a, a signal, you know, SIG child or something like that. And it can, it's not really the POSIX stuff at this level. We're below that, but it gets a notification, something happened. So uh, it checks its table to, um, to find out what happened. And usually what it does is run a shell script, and the shell script would be like send mail to an administrator, see, you know, go f start up the driver again, that kind of stuff. Um, so it also pings them regularly to check if everybody's okay. So the reincarnation server will go to the disk driver and say, hi, disk driver, how you doing? And the disk driver says, everything's great. I did 47 requests last second. So it's happy now for two seconds and pings it again and says, hi, disk driver, how you doing? And the disk driver says, great, I did 84 requests last second. Okay, everything's great. And then it pings it again two seconds later. How you doing? Okay, um, a disk driver, hi, I'm, I'm the reincarnation server. Hi, uh, how you doing? Okay, let's try that one more time. <laughs> I am the reincarnation server, and you're a goddamn disk driver, and you're going to answer me, how are you doing? No answer. So it kills the disk driver. And then it goes and starts a new one. Of course, how does it get one? It can't go to the disk. It keeps a copy of the disk driver's, you know, the disk driver code in the RAM disk in memory. So it's always got a way to restart the disk driver from scratch. And of course, once it has a running, running disk driver, it can fetch all the other drivers from the disk. And the drivers are set up to be item potent. So if the file system says to the disk, read this block, it can read it again if it has to. So with a little bit of effort, you can make this actually work. Okay, well, we've done that. So here's the, the same story again. The file system story um, with an error. So the file system says to the disk, go read this block for me, and it crashes. Instead of answering, it just crashes. Now, the reincarnation server hears about that. You know, it gets notification that one of its children crashed. So it goes through this whole protocol, decides 
you know, tries to kill it off because it might be an infinite loop and it's not really dead yet, but kills it off if need be, starts up a new one, tells the file server there's a new disk driver. Now the file system, which has to be written so it's basically idempotent, now takes, you know, has to remember the commands it gave to the disk driver, looks in the table and says, oh, I was busy issuing these commands. I haven't got answers for them yet. Tell the new one what to do. The new one gets the commands. If it fails again, you can repeat this indefinitely and eventually you know, hopefully you get an answer. Many of the errors are transient. You know, they're weird timing errors that two things happen at the same time it shouldn't have. If you try it again, often it works. A lot of the time you can recover from that. So that's sort of the basic mechanism. It's self-healing. The system detects its own failure and is able to recover from it. And we try to use this in a number of places. This is sort of the basic idea of a self-healing system. You know, constantly check on your own health and if something goes wrong, have a way to deal with that. Okay. Um, Kernel reliability and also security. Um, fewer lines of code means fewer kernel bugs. I mean, all security errors are basically bugs. Nobody ever puts security holes in their own code. And these are basically programming errors that some, you know, somebody's got a buffer overrun or you know, something that nobody expected. And if you've got less code and you've got a th one bug per thousand lines of code, you've got fewer bugs. Okay? And so the critical code simply has fewer bugs because it's smaller. The total system probably has the same number of bugs as everybody else does. But they're, in user space, very much isolated, as I told you before, so they have less power to do damage. So that's really the key to the design. So the trusted computing base is basically smaller. There's no foreign code in the kernel. With other systems, if you get some new device, it comes with a driver, and you install that in your kernel. And that driver was written by a kid in Taiwan whose boss was breathing down his neck. We got a ship, we got a ship. And the kid says, it's not finished yet. And they've even started to test it. And the boss says, I don't care. We have to ship the product. We'll ship it, we'll make a new release later. And you put that in your kernel. We think that's a bad design. You, know, you put it in user space with very limited power. It can't do you know, too much damage. If the audio driver isn't debugged yet, it can, you know, somebody who attacks it can make weird noises, but they can't take over the machine because it doesn't have the power to fork a shell. It doesn't have any power to do anything except make weird noises. Okay? So that's sort of the basic idea. Also, we, we opted for static data structures. There's no malloc in the kernel. It's a little bit inefficient in the sense of the process table is a fixed size, fixed at compile time. But getting rid of malloc and buffer allocation and all that stuff you know, eliminates an awful lot of problem. So removing the bugs to moving them to user space doesn't reduce the number, but it reduces their power to do damage. Okay? Inner process. Um, communication, all the messages are fixed length, 64 bytes, okay? And there's a few places you need something longer, it puts a pointer in and then somebody's got to fetch it. We have a whole procedure for that. So with fixed length messages, everything's 64 bytes, there's a type message buffer, you know, in some header file, and there's no buffer overruns, everything's fixed length, so it makes it uh, simpler in a lot of ways. We had a rendezvous system that A wanted to send a message to B, so A sent the message and B got it and sent back an answer, but we had problems with that ultimately. There were no lost messages, which was great, and there was no buffer management, which was great. Um, we had to add asynchronous messages because if the client sent a message to the server and then the client died and the server couldn't get, get send the reply back, the server hung. And so to get rid of that, we had to go to an additional mechanism of asynchronous messages, which we didn't like, but we were sort of forced to do that. So, you know, and we've unified, we've, interrupts are awful, you know. Um, so we, at the very, very lowest level, they're turned into messages to whoever you know, has signed up to, to get the interrupt. Okay, driver reliability and security. Remember, drivers are basically untrusted code. They're running all by themselves in isolated user processes, and that's different than in most systems where a driver has to be trusted code. And given that the driver is written by a kid in Taiwan who was under time pressure, I think it's better to have this you know, be user code and the MMU keeps it away. So if some driver is compromised due to a bug in it, um, that bug can't spread to other components because it's limited to wh who it can talk to and under what conditions and which calls it can make. This principle of least authority limits the scope of the bug. So the bug probably can't get out of the component it's in. Now, if it's in a disk driver, you've got problems. But most of the drivers can, you know, can't talk to the disk. So, you know, and it can't touch the kernel data structures, which is very important. You know, in other systems, if there's a bug in some module, it can write all over the kernel data structures, and then you're toast. Here, it can't happen. Nobody can write on the kernel data structures except the kernel. A bad pointer, which you know, happens all the time in C, only brings down one thing. The reincarnation server sees that, and it tries to recover from that. Okay? If something gets in a loop and doesn't answer the pings, then for, as far as the reincarnation is concerned, 
server is concerned. It's dead. Kill it. You know, start a new one. Okay? So we can handle all kinds of problems, and we restrict the damage, again, these things can do, because they're not super user. They're just regular processes that have to ask the microkernel for permission to do anything. And if you're asking for something that you shouldn't be doing, the answer is no. Okay? Other advantages of user drivers um, is a shorter development cycle I mean, for programmers. It's a normal programming model. You start up a driver, it runs, it crashes. You, know, you, can, you can debug it, you know, just like a, nor a normal program crashing. You know, you've got some chance of getting a reasonable dump. And you, you say, oh, I fixed the error back to the compiler. You have to reboot the computer, which takes a couple of minutes. So it's an easier programming model, and it's more flexible. We ran some experiments. We ran a lot of experiments on things. Um, Fault injection. We injected 800,000 faults into each of three Ethernet drivers. Um, we did it on the binary driver, so at runtime, we just wrote stuff all over the, the driver. Actually, we didn't write junk. We intentionally looked for things that mimicked programming errors, like a branch less than was turned into a branch less than or equal to. It's like you know, the equivalent of, you know, for i equals 0, i less than n, and you meant i less than or equal to n, you know, that kind of stuff. We, we overwrote, created that kind of errors. And we injected 100 faults waited a second to see if anything crashed. And if it didn't, we injected another 100 faults and went on until we got bored. And um, <laughs> you know, we managed to crash drivers like 18,000 times. And sometimes you'll inject a fault, and that code is not executed. You know, it's, somewhere, you know, it's not needed right now. So nothing happens. So we crash the drivers all the time. But we never crashed the operating system, you know, which, as you'd expect. So we ran very, very comprehensive fault injection experiments and so on. A port of um, Minix 3 to the ARM. At some point, we decided we should be doing an ARM port, uh, one of my programmers, Arun Thomas, I don't know, is he here, Arun? No, anyway, yeah, hi. Arun did the, uh, the port, and we had to restructure the, the source tree from multiple architectures. Actually, Minix 1 ran on multiple architectures, the Amiga and Atari and Spark and a whole bunch of things that got sort of lost along the way somewhere. Um, we had to change the booting to uh, do U-boot so we could boot on the ARM. It's, it's different than on PCs. You had to rewrite the low-level code dealing with the hardware, you know, touching the MMU and page tables and, and the very low-level stuff, of course, is different on the ARM. Um, you know, the context switching is different. Paging is different. Uh, we, we threw out the x86 segmentation code. The, the x86 could actually run Multix. It had segmentation and paging, like Multix did. But nobody ever used Well, uh, OS2 used it a little bit. But most other systems didn't actually use the ability that the 386 had going back to 1985. Since nobody was using it, we, we sort of said, all right, let's throw it out. So we threw that out. And then at that point, we imported the NetBSD ARM headers and libraries and the build.sh for cross tool chain support because we figured people weren't likely to be doing their builds on an ARM, although it's certainly possible. But we figured there'd be a lot of cross compilation, so we had to change the whole build system. And we wrote drivers for the SD card and some of the Beagle things which I'll talk about in a minute. Okay? And then the focus kind of changed to embedded systems a little bit. And in particular, we got interested in the Beagle series, the Beagle Bone. Beagle Black, and so on, because this is open source hardware. That um, it's, you know, it's, about this, it's about the size of a small smartphone, and it costs you know, about $50, roughly, depending on which model you've got. And it's you know, about 9 centimeters by 5 centimeters, and it's a complete PC with an arm on it. Okay? It's got the whole, everything you expect on a PC is on this little size board for $50. And I think people use it for uh, prototyping embedded systems, but if you had an expensive embedded system, you just put the Beagle board in there, and you're done. Um, so here's some of the characteristics. CPU is an ARM of V7. It's a Cortex A8. Their numbering is a little bit strange. But um, the clock runs at a gigahertz, so it's reasonably fast. It's got half a gig of RAM on it. It's got four, four gigs of flash memory, so the board has a disk on it effectively. It's got a you know, solid state disk of four gigabytes, so you can have a file system and everything on this thing. It's got uh, 1080p video. Um, it's got 92 little pins on it that you can run out to turn lights on and read switches and sensors and all kinds of things you'd use in an embedded system. These are basically just readable and writable from software. Uh, it's got 100 megabit Ethernet. It's got one USB port on it, so you can hook a USB device on that could conceivably could be a hub, so you can have more USB devices if you wanted. It's open source. You can find out how the hardware works. Uh, these days, it's often hard to find out how the hardware works because they won't tell you, but this is completely open source. And it's like $45 or $55, depending on which models, around $50. There's different, there's several models of this that vary a little bit. We also looked at the Raspberry Pi B+, sort of a competing board. It's got an ARM V6, so it's an older processor. It runs slower at 700 megahertz instead of a gigahertz. Same size RAM, doesn't have any disk on it, which is a disadvantage because you can actually 
you can't put a file system and everything on the board because it's got no disk. Um, it's got 1080p video. It's got fewer uh, GPIO pins. It's also got 100 meg of Ethernet. It's got four USB ports, which is a plus. So if you get a four USB devices without a hub, so that's a plus of that. And it's not open source, so it's hard to figure out how it works. They won't tell you. And um, it's a little bit cheaper. So all in all, we thought the open source, open source hardware and a more powerful processor would be a better idea. I don't know. Okay, anyway. Um, I, I will admit, I'm big enough to admit I was wrong once. Once. Um, on, uh, on January 29th, 1992, I posted to comp.os.minix, the Usenet news group now on Google. Um, people were bugging me to add this feature and that feature. And you know, I said basically, don't get me wrong, I'm not unhappy with Linux. It will get all the people who want me to turn Minix into BSD off my back. Okay? Because they were all, add this, add this. I didn't want to do all that stuff. Um, I apologize. Um, I do want to turn Minix into BSD. It just took me 20 years to realize this. <laughs> Sorry about that. Kind of slow. Um, so, Minix 3 meets BSD. There's Minix. There's uh, BSD. Um, so we get <laughs> something like that. And um, as all of you know, BSD Demon is copyright 1988 by uh, Marshall Kirk McCusick and used with his permission. Or maybe it's like this, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so why BSD? Um, well, we didn't have any application software, and we discovered um, that people don't like it if there's no application software. BSD was a proven, portable, quality product. It's been out there for a very, very long time. And it's got, I think, better code quality. Linux code quality is marginal, you know. Um, we've, we've tried compiling Linux with LLVM, for example. You can't do it, because it's not written in C. It's written in GCC, okay? And they're different. And so you use the LLVM compiler, which is better in many ways, and it doesn't work. There's thousands and thousands of compilation errors, you know? And so, you know, it's just, a lot of the code in Linux is, ooh, okay? And we like package source, which is a really nice package manager. And there's thousands of packages out there, and they all work sort of, you know, easily. There's an active community, of course. License compatibility, because we're, we're BSD compatible license. I was the keynote speaker at Linux Australia a few years ago. Okay, so I was down there in Sydney giving this talk about, you know, Minix, which is kind of odd, but whatever. I didn't mention licensing during the talk. Somebody asked me, you know, in question, what, what's the license? And I said, it's BSD license. And the audience broke out cheering. This is at a Linux conference. They broke out cheering when I said Minix was BSD license. I didn't expect that. Okay, so it's why NetBSD? I think mostly because of its emphasis on portability. That um, if you port it to 80 platforms, you can't have a lot of weird, you know, 80, you know, x86 dependent stuff in the middle of the code that doesn't work well on, you know, all the other architectures they ported to. That really forces you to stick to all the standards and be fairly clean and not have inline assembly code and that kind of stuff. So that we thought it would be easier to deal with that because the great emphasis on portability. I'm not sure. We didn't try the other ones, but it could have. Anyway, some NetBSD features. We use Clang LVM as the main compiler. We do have GCC, but the main default compiler is, is Clang LVM. We use the NetBSD build system. We use the L file format, which is new for us. The source tree, you know, for multiple architecture stuff is sort of modeled on the way NetBSD works. The headers and all the libraries come from NetBSD. VEX11. A package source works, and last time I looked, we could build about 5,040 packages right out of the box. They just build properly. Um, there's a bunch of other packages that don't build because there's one piece missing somewhere. You know, sometimes it's, it's as simple as a font you know, that we don't have, and this, this thing needs this font, and we don't have the font. We didn't have time to go port the font. I, I put in the, the footnote about the license, but the, 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 the demon. Um, um, uh, nevertheless, it, it, uh, it builds you know, with all the Minix stuff underneath it. And so you know, it's sort of NetBSD-like, but not entirely. Okay. Um, we don't have kernel threads. That, that wasn't in there originally. We do have user land threads, but not kernel threads. Um, some of the system calls are missing, like LWP and message and SEM calls are missing. Some of these could be added easily, I think. Don't have clone. Um, you know, we don't have some of the get calls, some of the octal calls. Don't have KQ or K, Ktrace. Don't have vfork, but that's basically only performance. Um, you don't have job control. It seems to me if you've got X11, if, you, if something's running and doing something, and you want to do something else, just start under the window. It's like, I don't see why you have to mess around with that. And, it's, and job control is very complicated. Um, some of the minor calls are missing. Nevertheless, we can build over 5,000 packages, so we, 
a lot of stuff builds, but if some package depends on some weird ioctal that we don't have, then you know, it doesn't work. Uh, QA tests, uh, I don't know, there's a whole bunch of these tests. Um, I guess the bottom line here is um, 2139 out of 2651 passed, that's 81%. So we're sort of 81% BSD net BSD compatible in some sense. But it's the weird ones that we didn't, you know, that didn't work. The, the, the easy ones worked. So it's kind of biased toward the 81% include most of the easy stuff and less of the hard stuff. Okay, so here's the system architecture of the whole thing. So the bottom level is, so is the micro, Minix microkernel and then all the Minix drivers and then the Minix servers. So it's all Minix up to this point. And now when you go to user land, it's all NetBSD. Okay, so we've re-implemented the NetBSD user environment on top of this fault tolerance, you know, modular, much more bulletproof, you know, under, you know uh, underlying layers. So to the application programmer, you know, it just it's sort of net, it's 81% NetBSD. The headers are there, the libraries are there, you know, most of the system calls are there, but not some of the weirder ones. So the application programmer just sees it as more or less normal NetBSD. But it's got all these other properties talking about of reliability and you know fault tolerance and whatnot, you know self-healing. So it's sort of a mix, which I, we think gives you some of the good properties of NetBSD and the good properties of Minix sort of mixed together. It, it runs on the Beagle boards. Uh, you can't read this, but green is good, red is bad. Okay, so um, you know depending on which board it is, sometimes we you know there's some features of the Beagle boards we didn't have time to implement. Um, you know, frame buffers, uh, sometimes we did it, sometimes we didn't. But much of it is there, but not all of it. So it covers, it covers most of the Beagle, Beagle stuff. Um, now, what's your role? Now, it's become an open source project. It's always open source, but um, it's now, you know, volunteer project. Um, so I hope some of you will join, you know, people who like to play with BSD stuff. This is an, a new toy to play with. Here's some things to do. If there's some system calls that are absolutely crucial that we've left out, Maybe they could be added, but you know, mucking around with the kernel and the servers requires you to know what you're doing. It's not you know, for beginners, clearly. And we think we've got most of them. Um, certainly porting more packages. We don't have Java. We don't have a proper browser. You know, porting other you know, NetBSD or FreeBSD software would be really, really nice. In many cases, it may not be hard. We just haven't had the, the time or manpower to do it. Um, write the other drivers for the, for the Beagle series we didn't, we didn't have. Port it to the Raspberry Pi, which may be hard because it's not open source. You may not, they may not tell you how the thing works. But there may be other platforms down there, little you know, small embedded boards where you do know the thing. Rump is certainly something that we're aware of, but you haven't had the manpower to look at. Um, you know, some kind of, you know, you've got to port some libraries, you know, I don't know, QT or something, and then port a GUI. We don't have a proper GUI. Many programmers are happy with X11. They don't really care about a GUI. But it would be nice to have some kind of a GUI. We had uh, something called, I think, Equinox. In a previous version, but we sort of lost it. Anyway, here's um, Minix in a nutshell. It's a microkernel re-implementation of NetBSD. So under, under underlying system has all the properties of the microkernel, the multi-server, the self-healing. But to the users, it looks like BSD. Um, it's open source. It's got the BSD license. It's highly compatible with NetBSD. And to the extent that NetBSD is compatible with the other BSDs, we're also as compatible or not. But that's not our fault. We just copied one of them. And to the extent that it's not like the other ones, well, you know, sorry. Um, it supports both LLVM and GCC, although LLVM is the default. Uses a package source. There's about 5,000 packages that build out of the box. It's at minix3.org. It's free, of course. Download it. Positioning of this thing, um, we're trying to show that multi-server systems actually work and can be made reliable. Um, demonstrate that drivers belong in user mode. Um, Highly reliable and fault tolerant applications. Um, there are increasingly many consumer applications where high reliability is important. I know there's a company I mean, in Holland, maybe in the US, which is making thermostats, which is kind of an iPad glued to your wall that controls everything in your house. And it's on the internet. Okay? Th they're very worried about security. And they're very worried about reliability. Okay? You know, people can hack your house from the outside, you know, turn off the burglar alarm and so on. You know, or a thing goes down for a few minutes once in a while. Th they don't want that. So, there are increasingly many applications where fault tolerance and high reliability are, are an issue, and this might well fit there. Um, you know, I don't know if anybody, there's the $100 laptop project at MIT. I don't know if somebody's done it yet, but if somebody's going to come up with a $50 single chip laptop for the third world at some point where small memory footprint is going to be an issue, 
you know, if all the RAM is on the chip. And the memory footprint on this thing is relatively small. Um, you know, embedded system certainly is the target now. Um, now. Here's something that's not in the current version, but we're working on it pretty hard, and we hope to get it in within half a year if we're lucky. Live update. This is somebody's PhD thesis, and the thesis is finished, and the software sort of works mostly, but it's a little bit that's not, not you know, ready. Um, software is updated to fix bugs all the time, to improve performance, add new features, and whatnot. And our goal is to update the operating system to a new version without rebooting. So we're not talking about a three-line kernel patch. We're talking about a new version of the operating system, or some part of it, which might be substantially different than its predecessor, and to do this on the fly without interrupting running programs. Okay? And you know, we don't want to restart the running programs, even though we've changed the operating system out from under it. Okay? So the new operating system might fix new data structures. So in the old version, you used, I don't know, uh, a linked list for something or other, and the new version went over to a hash table. Okay, so there's actually different data structures. It's not a three-line patch. And uh, have the user programs continue to run. And there's a lot of state in there, you know, timers and open files and whatnot. So the, the state transfer is really the hard part of here. Okay, so here's an example of how this might work. So suppose Apache is running on uh, FreeBSD 10.1 or something, or it doesn't really matter. And what you want is Apache is still running, and now you've switched over to BSD 10.2. So you've changed the operating system, and the programs in running an application you know, space don't notice you've changed the operating system. They continue to run. Their state hasn't been affected in any way. We've got a new operating system. Okay? You can't do that easily with most systems. And you know, we're trying to replace the OS while process running. This is hard to do with BSD or Linux or Windows, but we can sort of do it with Linux. Um, there's a couple of loose ends we haven't quite got fixed, but working on those now. So here's how it works in Minix, and you'll see why it's much easier in Minix than the other system. So say a patching is running, you've got a memory manager, some drivers, and a file system version 6.0, and whatnot. And now we want to do an update. What we want to go to is, you know, we have a memory manager, but we're not changing that, because that's okay. It's the same one. Driver hasn't been changed, but here's file system 6.0, and there's file system 7.0. So we've changed you know, part of the operating system, but not all of it, because that's often the case, especially if you're thinking in terms of, oh, these things are modular. I don't have to update everything at once, although we have the ability to do that. Um, typically, you're changing the file system because you found a bug in it, or you've got some new features in the file system, but there's nothing happened to memory manager, and there's no, no need to do that all at once, okay? Although I say we do have the ability to do that to some extent. Um, so how do we do the update? Um, OK, works sort of like this. Um, the manager tells some process, like the old file system, OK, uh, you're going to be phased out. Sorry about that. You're obsolete. Um, and it says, shit, but all right, this, that's life. Um, don't take on any new work. So when work comes in the form of messages, queue the messages, but don't start on them. Meanwhile, you're, you're in the middle of other things. You know, you've got disk request pending and God knows what. Fix all, finish all that off so all the existing work you know, it's finished off, sending answers to everybody, and eventually you get to a quiescent state where no work is pending because all the work you were doing has finished, and none of the work that's come in since you got this message has been started. The message is just queued up nicely in, in, a, in a queue in RAM somewhere in your, inside your address space. Um, so it finishes all of the work, it queues all the new work, and then it sends a message back to the manager saying, okay, I'm ready to go now. You know, I'm not in the middle of anything. Who's trying to update it in the middle of anything, it's horrible. A lot of the work on live update, other people are doing, are trying to do it in the middle of, you know, they're halfway through something or other, they're trying to update it then. That seems to me crazy, that the work that these servers do takes milliseconds, you know. You don't need, you can wait 30 milliseconds until you finish whatever transactions you're busy with. Go to a quiescent state where you're not doing anything in the server, all the new work has been queued, so you haven't lost anything. And then you say to the manager, I'm ready to roll. Okay? And um, so what the manager does is it creates a new copy of the file system. Remember, the file system is a separate process, right? Unlike these other systems, it's a, just a user process. So the file system creates a new process, the, the manager creates a new process, puts into the code of that new process the new code of the new file system, just another process. And I got two file systems sitting there. One is the real file system, the old one. And then there's a new one over there. The new one's not doing anything yet, but it's there. It's a separate process. And one of the things, one of the reasons we use LLVM 
is LLVM is programmable. You can add new passes very easily. It's got a little programming language in it to do things. So we've added a pass during the compilation, which takes all the data structures and makes a table in memory listing for every data structure and every variable, you know, its name and where it is and its type and everything we know about it is in memory at runtime. So it's relatively straightforward for any piece of the operating system to find all of the data structures because there's a table there listing them all, okay? So the new file system has to get the state from the old file system because there's open files and stuff. It's got a table listing all of its data structures. So it goes to the old one and says, give me, give me the state I need. So it gives them the state, and then when it's got all the state, it's ready to go. So you transfer the state, you know, one object at a time. And when all the, the, um, the state has been transferred, then you can create a third file system which runs backwards. You're taking the old state, now you run it back to the, you know, you take the new state and run it back to the old state. And then you compare them, okay? And if they agree, you're in business. And this is sort of like, suppose you're translating English to Dutch or Italian or something else, and, you know, using Google Translate, and then you translate the Dutch back to the English. If what you get back sort of matches what you had in the first place, then although you can't prove it, there's a pretty good ch chance that the translation is correct. You know, it's unlikely that a totally garbled translation would give you back the original. And so we do that, and if everything is okay, we go forward. If it's not okay, we abort the whole thing, and then you, the old one continues to run, nothing lost. Okay, just the update didn't work. So here's how it sort of works. Here's, let's say, here's um, you know, Apache or whatever, the old file system in the kernel, and then somebody says to the file system, get ready for an update, and um, the new one is started, new process created, and the new one looks into tables and says to the old one, I need a variable X. Okay, and then the answer is, here's the variable X, and then it goes through the whole table one at a time, getting all the state it needs, things it doesn't need, it doesn't ask for. You know, if some data structure is no longer used in the new version, it never asks for it. And this, you know, it's a little bit more complicated than this because it has to identify, you know, what's what, and there's, there's a little bit of complication. But basically, it has a list of what it needs, and it just goes to ask for it. And then the third one, the checker, is started, and it goes back to version seven saying, give me this stuff, and it tries to run the process backwards to recreate version six, you know, and after it's answered, there's a comparison between the original version and the one recreated from, say, version seven, and if they match, we're in business, we kill off everything else and go forward to version seven. If they don't match, we kill off seven and, the, and the, you know, the very, the third one, and can, version six continues to run, the update is aborted, but everything keeps running, and Apache is happy. Just you know, the, whoever did the update gets the message: update failed. Okay, for some reason, some information about why it failed. But basically, the system continues to run either way. Okay. Now, some of you may know about Case Place, which is done at MIT. Case Place goes in and can make security patches by finding at runtime the code that's a problem, replacing it with a jump to somewhere else in memory, executing the correct instructions, and then jumping back. Okay, and it can only handle very small patches. It patches the running process. Okay? Um, over time, all these jumps to other places are going to accumulate in memory, and memory is going to fill up with all these little jumps. So if there's a lot of them, you're going to end up losing some memory. And if the update fails part way, you're toast, because there's no way to roll it back. In our scheme, if the update fails for whatever reason, we just kill off the whole update, the old process continues to run whatever it was doing, and everything is fine, and you know, there's, there's no update but the old one is still running and the applications are still happy. So it's got a, a number of things we can do. And certainly, um, case splice can handle major updates where you've changed one data structure to the other. To the extent that it's relatively straightforward, we do that automatically. To the extent that it's not at all straightforward, the, the, the writer of the new code has to put in conversion code to convert from the old data structure to the new data structure. So if you've really changed in a major way, like from a linked list to a hash table, that the writer of the new one has to provide the conversion routine. So it gets the linked list, converts it internally to a hash table, and then it's got a hash table. Okay, so, you know, if it's really, really weird, you may have to do it yourself. But for straightforward cases, it's all automatic. Okay, some other uses of live update. It gives you enhanced security. For example, there's a lot of attacks on systems which are in the general category of, re like, return to libc. That the hacker who's trying to break the system knows the exact memory layout of the, the program, knows where the return address is on the stack, 
overrun some buffer in such a way that at the position where the return address is, is now a carefully planted pointer to the code he wants to execute in the library or so on, and can now get, take control over and go to a library team and his stories about gadgets and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that requires having a very, very detailed knowledge of what the memory layout of the program looks like. We can do a live update to, the, to itself very high frequency. So we can change the code, the data structures, the layout at a fairly high rate. So this is like address space randomization in spades. We can update it continuously during execution. And you can choose what frequency you want. There's some performance hit, obviously. But um, you can update it. So anybody trying to attack you based upon knowledge of what memory looks like doesn't have that knowledge anymore because we're changing it dynamically. Okay? So it gives you a bit of security. Um, it also reduces exposure to information leakage attacks for the same reason. If somebody doesn't know what memory looks like, they can't exploit that because we, can, we can change it at a high rate. Um, we also can do garbage collection in C because in the kernel, remember the new version has a list of what it needs. Okay? So it only asks for those things it needs. Things it doesn't need and pointers that don't point anywhere you know, useful, they don't get picked up in the new version. So if somehow there's a memory leak and there's a piece of stuff nobody points to, nobody's going to ask for it because we're only going through the actual variables. And if there's some pointer p you know, in the new code, we're going to fetch the thing it points to because we know what it's pointing to, we know its type, we know its address and everything. But if there's some chunk of memory which nobody is pointing to, it's dead basically, we don't fetch that. So it cleans up you know, memory leaks. So it's kind of like garbage collection even in C. Um, so only live data is copied over. And this, this can fix you know, basically malloc type uh, leaks when there's been malloc and not free. Another interesting thing we're working on, but that's not in the code, and I don't know if it'll ever make it, is fault injection. Because we think testing is very important. And what we have is a scheme using LLVM where for every basic block, we can put in a test, should we inject the fault here or not? And then there's the original block, and then there's the faulty block with some change to it. And so at runtime, you come in at every basic block and say, shall I inject the fault or not? And you go this way, you go that way. Okay? And they say LLVM does this automatically, so there's no programmer uh, you know, stuff. And so the new program structure has got some basic blocks, but every basic block is now one of these blocks with a test at the top and then faulty, not faulty. So by turning on flags, we can at runtime with a single binary make all these tests. And the reason you know, we want to do this is that if you want to you know, um, inject faults at, on the binary, you have no structural information what you're doing. If you do it on the sources, you have to recompile it all the time. And it's very, very expensive for, for large systems. And here we have the advantage of source time, fault injection, and information, but with the performance of runtime. And in addition, we can even optimize that. If we, if we only want to test for a certain class of faults, we can make a run over the binary and turn these flags on and off so it doesn't have to make the test, which messes up the branch prediction in the hardware and just make, un, and make unconditional jumps to the right place. So it's this very elaborate uh, fault testing, fault injection uh, scheme. Now, a few words about the logo. Everybody's got to have a logo of an animal-like thing. So we have a raccoon. Um, wh why a raccoon? Well, they're small. They're cute. Um, they're very clever. Um, they're at, you know, open garbage cans and stuff. They're very agile. Um, they eat bugs, which is uh, very important. <laughs> and they're probably more likely to visit your house than a penguin, <laughs> unless you live in Antarctica. Um, we have a website, minix3.org. It's sort of simple, sort of like the BSD websites. It's not, not a complicated website. The documentation is in a wiki, wiki.minix3.org. Uh, you can help. For example, you can document the system. Um, so there's this wiki with all kinds of you know, information about what you need as a user, what you need as a developer, you know, all, this, you know, all kinds of stuff about the system. So you can edit it like any other wiki. Um, you might ask, does anybody look at Minix ever? Um, here's the traffic for the last year by month, and if I read this correctly, the website is getting something like 15 to 20,000 hits a month and has been doing so for at least 10 years that I've been tracking this. Um, the total visits to the main page since 2004 is about 3.1 million, so we've had 3 million visits to the website. I've also kept track of the downloads since 2007 by looking at the log, so these aren't visits to the download page, these are actual, you know, log entries of somebody pulled in the ISO image of this thing. And there's been about 650,000 downloads of the ISO image. So there is a, a user community out there. 
of some sort, I'm not sure what, what it is, but 600,000 people have gone to the trouble of loading the CD-ROM image. And needless to say, you can run Minix on VMware or Xen or any you know, other virtual box or other thing. And the wiki even describes how you do that. In most cases, it's pretty straightforward. There's a, a news group. The, the Usenet news group has gone, you know, Google bought Usenet. And so there's now a, a group, a Google group, uh, comp.os.minix, where people can ask questions and sort of community, and we're trying to build that up. So the conclusion is, I think current operating systems are kind of bloated and unreliable by my definition of never seen a crash and don't know anybody's ever seen one. It's an attempt to build a reliable and secure operating system using different structure. Kernel's quite small, 15,000 lines of code. I think about 14,000 plus are in C, and there's a little bit of assembly code at the, the very, very bottom where you've got to have assembly code, but it's basically in C. Um, the operating system itself runs as a bunch of user processes, each with the principle of least authority. Okay? Each driver is a separate process. You know, each of the operating system components has limited privileges, so, you know, so there's bitmaps in there which say what you can do, what you can't do, and you can only do the things you're supposed to do. If you try to do something you can't do, it tells you error or no permission. Uh, faulty drivers can replace on the fly. We're also working on replacing the, the stateful components on the fly, but that's not there yet. It's a little bit trickier. Uh, the live update is possible, and it works in the lab kind of, but there's a couple of things with weird corner cases with pointers we haven't quite got working yet, but we know how to do it, so we're working on it. Um, so I hope that'll be in there. Um, we're trying to find out what people are actually doing with Minix. There's been over 600,000 downloads. We don't know who they are, what they're doing. Um, so if you download Minix from minix3.org, give it a try. Um, on the website, there's a, a survey. You can take a short survey of, like, who are, are you an engineer? Or, I mean, what are you, and why are you doing this? Or like, you know, are you a student? Or, you know, are you using a commercial product? We don't even know, because BSD license doesn't require you to if you want to use it in a product, go ahead. It's fine. But we, we don't know about it. We'd like to know. So we've had all these downloads. We don't know what people are doing, so we appreciate if you fill in the, uh, the little questionnaire. One last thing we'll add here. Um, if you happen to be a student and you're you know, like a bachelor's student who's looking for a master's at some point, um, we have a master's in parallel and distributed systems. You'll find it the simplest way is just Google me. And, you know, it's obvious. And on my homepage, there's a link to it. Um, and there's a video there about the master's program. And the, the actual name is pdcs.vu.org. But you'll probably forget that, so just go find me, and it's on my homepage. Anyway, that's the end. Thank you. <laughs>